Hello, we're glad you've joined us for this live webinar, Comprehensive Enumeration of Immune Cells in Solid Tumors. I am Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. It's brought to you by IonPath. IonPath is a venture-backed commercial stage company founded by Stanford researchers out of the lab of Dr. Gary Nolan. The company is focused on revolutionizing pathology with multiplexed ion beam imaging, MIBI, technology. MIBI is a multiplexed imaging platform with unmatched resolution, sensitivity, and throughput. To learn more, visit www.ionpath.com. Let's get started. You can post questions to the speaker during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them into the drop-down box located on the far left of your screen labeled Ask a Question and click on the Send button. Questions will be answered after the presentation. To enlarge the slide window, click on the arrows at the top right-hand corner of the presentation window. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by typing it into the answer question box located on the far left of your screen. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process of obtaining your credits. I now present today's speaker, Mike Angelo, MD, PhD, Principal Investigator at the Stanford Blood Center. Dr. Angelo's academic background spans the fields of physics, biochemistry, electrical engineering, and medicine. During his residency in clinical pathology at the University of California, San Francisco, Dr. Angelo became interested in developing novel methods for immunohistochemical multiplexing using mass spectrometry. This led to the development of MIBI during his postdoctoral work in the Nolan Lab at Stanford University. Dr. Angelo is now interested in optimizing MIBI and other mass reporter-based technologies further with the goal of identifying new transcriptional and translational signatures in solid tissue malignancies and in allergic and other immunological disorders to help improve clinical diagnosis and treatment. Dr. Angelo will now begin his presentation. Hi, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Mike Angelo. I'm, I'm in the pathology department at Stanford and uh, really happy to be able to talk with everyone that is viewing this presentation today about some of the work that we've been doing with multiplexed ion beam imaging in my lab. So we've recently uh, developed new instrumentation for performing these assays over the last couple of years. and most recently, we just published a paper looking, using MIBI to look at a cohort of triple negative breast cancer tumors um, and found some very interesting things there pertaining to uh, checkpoint protein expression amongst immune cell subsets and how that is related to the histological composition of tumors. So today, um, I'm going to be going over sort of the basic uh, workflow principles of MIBI. And uh, after going through that and the, and the capabilities that you can do with this platform and why you would even want to, you know, bother using a mass spec platform instead of something like a fluorescence-based platform, I was going to then talk to you all about some of the interesting, exciting findings that we uh, found in this triple negative breast cancer cohort and discuss a little bit the computational approaches that we use to get there. So to start off, um, MIBI is, a, is an imaging workflow that, is, that uses metal conjugated primary antibodies uh, similar to reporter-based assays you might have seen previously for a flow cytometry-like readout with mass cytometry. Uh, everything that we do in my lab is with uh, formal and fixed paraffin embedded tissue and usually archival human materials. You can use other types of tissue. I get asked a lot whether or not you can use like frozen and stuff like that, and all of those things are compatible. Um, my lab has, chose, has chosen to focus on using human FFPE samples because 
of the very large number of samples that are in clinical archives and many times have long-term follow-up data attached to them. So everything that we've done has been uh, developed and optimized and validated with those types of samples in mind. So essentially, uh, to do maybe it's very much like a regular IHC assay. Um, you mount the tissue on a slide, which you can see here in the cartoon. Uh, then after that, the tissue is treated with a single master mix of primary antibodies uh, for all of the proteins that you're interested in, and that can vary from 10 up to 30 or 40 primary antibodies. And each one of those primary antibodies is tagged with a unique elemental reporter. And so the little different colored uh, different colored balls that you see attached here to the antibodies. There's like four per antibody. Uh, each one of the different colors essentially represent, you know, tags with different masses. And ultimately, that's going to be what we're able to map spatially in the tissue is where those antibodies adhere to the tissue and therefore where those metals are localized spatially. So, but before we get to that, so the tissue is treated with the primary mix of antibodies. Um, after uh, there's no second, for those of you that have done IHC staining before fluorescence assays, this is purely a primary antibody assay, so there's no secondary amplification or secondary antibodies after that point. And so um, the excess antibody master mix is rinsed away, we dry it out, uh, usually by putting it in a vacuum jar under house vac for like an hour. And then after that, we put it inside the uh, custom-built mass spectrometer that we use to do this assay. And, and when we do that, um, that is equipped with, a, with an ion gun, a primary ion gun and that can, uh, that it shoots, it accelerates uh, charged massive particles. Uh, and these can be either um, oxygen ions or xenon ions or argon ions or a whole multitude of different things. But, but you have a massive, uh, you know, elemental uh, or, or dimolecular um, particle that is ionized and it's focused to a very fine spot. And that spot size can be anywhere from uh, two microns down to like 100 nanometers. And that spot is, is goes across the tissue pixel by pixel. And so for each, for, and so it sits on a single pixel for a set amount of time. And while it's doing that, it liberates all of these elemental reporters that are uh, that were attached to the antibodies and stuck to the tissue. So th and you can see that as a stream of sort of colored uh, uh, colored primary uh, secondary ions that are coming off. Those secondary elemental ions are then transported through the secondary through some ion optics, which enrich for uh, these ele these elemental reporters that we care about preferentially over. Uh, uh, ions that are arising that are comprised of organic material that might interfere with a uh, with a mass spectral analysis. So we can fi filter out the vast majority of those to where ultimately what's delivered to the mass spec at the end, which is the time of flight mass spectrometer, uh, an L a stream of secondary ions that's heavily enriched for elemental species. And so then what we have is, is for every single pixel in the image, we have a mass spectrum associated with each one of those pixels. And so, and you can see that here, there's kind of an example of three pixels with the call outs that go over to the mass spectra that each pixel has. And that means that for each one of those little colored peaks that you see there, we can pick one, one of the peaks, and we can generate a grayscale image that shows the spatial distribution and therefore the abundance of the antibodies which are targeted towards the proteins of interest. So for example, what you're looking at here and everything that you're going to see in this presentation today, none of these images were generated with any sort of light microscopy. These is, this is all ion image data to where we've essentially taken the intensity of these different metal reporters at each pixel and encoded it as a grayscale value in the picture. So for example, the one you're looking at right now is the antibody that we use as our nuclear marker, which is uh, we either use an antibody towards double-stranded DNA or histone H3. So if I blow this up, you can see that 
Um, this is human tonsil, uh, and um, we like to use tonsil for a lot of our um, uh, our QC and validation because my lab's very interested in immune cell subsets, particularly in uh, particularly in, within the immune oncology space. So we spend a lot of time selecting reagents, uh, validating them first by chromogenic IHC and then looking at them using MIBI. And so uh, tonsil, lymph nodes, spleen are all immune rich organs that we use on a frequent basis to do this. And so because, you know, MIBI is not a magic box. So, you know, it, it, it's still very much dependent on the reagents, the quality of the reagents that you're using, the antibody reagents that you're using, and how well those reagents have been titered and validated. And so uh, a very important part of getting good data out is to make sure that the validation is done, is done robustly and thoroughly. So I'm just going to show you some of the results now of what good antibody staining looks like for us once we validated the reagents. So if, um, for those of you that may, uh, may or may not be immunologists, essentially, uh, if you're looking at immune cell subsets uh, and tonsils, it's very useful because most of them are, there's a, you can usually find a, about everything you're looking for in tonsil, but um, tonsil can kind of be broken down into two general regions. And so in green, this ball-like structure is what's called a, a, you know, a follicle or a germinal center. And in red, you have the interfollicular region. And so the germinal centers are usually enriched in B cells, while the red region, uh, the interfollicular region, is usually more T cell enriched. Although even e there's still, even within each one of those regions, you still see some scattered cell types uh, uh, that are, are different in lineage. And so I, just to step through and show you exactly why this is useful, is for instance, let's say for T and B cells. So we know the T cells are supposed to, there's supposed to be more T cells in the interfollicular regions. And so here you can see that we are, the CD3, which is a specific lineage marker for T cells, is uh, well enriched along that border between the germinal center and the interfollicular region, whereas CD20 is in the germinal center and is green. And you can see it's, it's uh, we have a nice discrete border there delineating between T and B cells. And so now I'm just going to step through and show you some different immune cell subsets. And so the one thing to remember when you're looking at this data is that all of this data, the tissue was stained simultaneously with all the antibodies, and all of those antibody channels were read out simultaneously. So this is in no way a cyclical process. Uh, so if you look here to look at specific T cell subsets, the two major subsets most people think about is CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells. And so T cells should either express CD4 or CD8, although, you know, there is a current of double positive CD4 CDL cells, but they're usually very low in abundance. So, you know, in, in general, we should mostly see that the, we should mostly see cells that are red and green or red and blue, but not red, green, and blue. And so you can see here then that that's by and large what we see. We see orthogonal co-expression of CD3 with 4 or 8, but in general not 4 and 8. And so kind of digging into that a little further, we can then look at uh, even more granular levels of T cell subsets and look at co-expression within CD4 T cells of either FOXP3 or PD1. And so PD1 is a target that's a you know, of a lot of interest right now in immunotherapy trials. There's anti-PD-1 monoclonal antibodies that are used to treat multiple cancers now. And so you can see here that the sort of classic uh, expression pattern of PD-1, uh, bright PD-1 expression of CD4 uh, follicular helper T cells in the germinal center is easily delineated. And then FOXP3, which marks, uh, which marks um, regulatory T cells, is uh, nuclear and within uh, CD4 positive cells as well. So now just to kind of walk through a little more quickly, some other examples are CD45RO, which marks uh, memory T cells, LAG3, which is another uh, checkpoint uh, T cell receptor. And here you can see uh, KI67, which is a marker of proliferation, again, a nuclear marker. 
And you can see that in CD20 again, which is marking B cells, and we just put CD20 here along with HLA-DR to show that B cells, which are antigen-presenting cells, uh, also express a lot of, uh, you see nice co-expression of HLA-DR with CD20. And then lastly, just looking at uh, some of the, uh, some of the uh, macrophage uh, subsets that are a lot of interest right now, you can see here CD11B co-expression with PDL1 within follicular dendritic cells and also CD68 expression and some of the macrophages within that germinal center. So now, uh, you know, that's sort of um, what uh, we feel like the markers should look like in the same quality that you get once uh, you are in the area. You've got a well-validated panel and markers that, and, and you've selected anybody to perform well on the sample type of interest. They kind of shift gears and talking about what are the performance metrics of maybe the sort of real world performance metrics that you can expect. And so on the right here, this is a example of a of an image that we acquired recently in a study we're doing with uh, Carrie Nadal and Steve Galley, where we're looking at GI biopsies from patients with uh, peanut allergy. And right there you can see that pink the cell in there it's in pink that's showing co-expression of mast cell tryptase and chymase. So we're looking at mast cells within the gut. And this is, I put up this image because this is in general, I think this is probably the higher end of resolution that you can achieve with this platform, which is probably on the order of two to 300 nanometer resolution. But just kind of step through and show you. Uh, in principle, the resolution range is between 100 nanometers and 10 microns. Although 100 nanometers in practice can be very difficult to get to, not necessarily because of the capabilities of the system, but um, simply because of uh, vibrations most of the time in the facilities that uh, the systems can be housed in. So, for instance, we're on the second floor, and, uh, and, and vibrations within the room end up being a limiting factor for us on a lot of the stuff we can resolve. So we typically can't get much lower than around two, 250 nanometers or so. Um, uh, secondly, the field of view size is it essentially can be set instantly and electronically. We can go anywhere from a field of view size down to a micron, all the way up to one and a half millimeters. Uh, we get, we, we've been able to test and show that around 55 different uh, metal tags can be conjugated to antibodies and use as valid readouts. And the sensitivity that we've been able to estimate with recent benchmarking experiments uh, indicates that our sensitivity is on the order of around one to five antibodies per pixel. And the pixel rate, which is how many pixels we can acquire, uh, is around up to 10,000 pixels per second. Although in practice right now, I think we rarely uh, exceed around one to 2,000 pixels per second. So then, you know, one of the questions that becomes is, you know, when a lot of people see this, is they say, oh, well, why not just do everything at high resolution, right? Um, well, there's a reason. And the reason is, is that uh, MIBI is like a lot of other imaging platforms in the respect that you can, you can go high resolution. And one thing that is unique about MIBI is that when you go to higher resolution, it, you do not lose any sensitivity, but what you do, the trade-off that you do get is that the acquisition speeds go up uh, significantly the higher the resolution you want to you wanna run at. So give you kind of a feel for that. This is a single uh, nucleus that we crop from an image that uh, shows what sort of features you can delineate um, at resolutions that we sort of say or survey low res, medium res, and high res. And so, um, so the typical scan times then at these different resolutions for a half millimeter field of view, just to give you an idea. This, so you can see at the high res, which is the one that's all the way over to the right, uh, you know, about 250 nanometer resolution uh, is going to take a, a is going to take a, probably at least one and a half hours, if not more. Um, that, you know, one and a half hours is, is probably an optimistic estimate at uh, a resolution that high where you have, you know, highly abundant markers. But at that resolution, you can see that you can, you can easily delineate. Here we have uh, the two grayscale channels for double-stranded DNA and then for laminin AC, which marks a nuclear envelope. But you can see that at this resolution, we can actually 
see the finer features, the nuclear envelope or the shape of the chromatin uh, in the lamin AC channel, and also you can see the you can see the the nuclear features more clearly in the DNA channel as well. Um, as you go up to uh, low, uh, lower and lower resolution, you can see that we start to lose uh, we, some of the resolving power for those features until you get to the survey scan to where you can definitely resolve the nucleus itself, but we really haven't, we really cannot see any of the intranuclear morphology. Now, the thing is, though, is that at that survey scan resolution, that field only takes around 15 seconds or so. So as compared with one and a half hours of 250 nanometer resolution. So you can imagine then that there's um, that this this push and pull between resolution and acquisition speeds is uh, is a very important factor to think about when designing the MIBI experiments. Now, the one thing I will point out, though, is that um, as you can probably tell from this series of images, is that all of these images were rescans of the exact same field of view in the tissue. So. Um, each one of so we acquired these images at these resolutions by taking a scan of the field at 250 nanometer resolution, then changing the resolution and rescanning that same exact field at 500 nanometer resolution, so on and so forth. And so this gets to a really uh, I think important distinctive feature of the platform is um, you know acquisition time is important and it's something that you have to factor in when you're trying to decide how to design these experiments but um you can rescan the samples which means that you can actually use maybe much like a regular microscope and what do i mean by that i mean so it means that you can go and you can look at very large areas and so i'm going to show you an example here where we look at an entire tissue section uh and we can acquire all of the antibodies channels at that time and we do it a low resolution which allows us to cover a very large area relatively quickly we can then review those that survey region and we can identify regions that we think are interesting and then we can go back in and rescan those interesting regions at higher resolution so you know this is I this is sort of analogous to the way you know sort of a practicing pathologist operates when they're looking at slides right which is that they review the slide at low power they find regions they think are interesting or probative for the questions that they're asking. And then they go and they investigate those regions at a higher magnification. So to give you an idea of what that looks like, this is a full tissue section that uh, we tiled. Uh, I think this is over around five or 550 individual uh, fields of view that were tiled together to get this cohesive view of the entire tissue section. And so, um, and so here you can see carrot environment and SMA. And I've gated out these two regions here, uh, R1 and R2, which um, you can, and so and the reason I wanted to show you these was that uh, we can then, if we look at these two regions, uh, and we look at the multi-channel data from these two regions, so we're still looking at the survey image data here. You can see that they have, you know, the, in both cases, this is a triple negative breast cancer tumor, in both cases, uh, you know, we're seeing uh, keratin expression in the tumor cells. But in the case of R2, that uh, that local field of view has tumor cells that express cytokeratin 6, whereas R1 does not. Um, and the other thing that we see is that uh, is that R1 has a relative enrichment of uh, CD45 positive immune cells and the tumor is apparently expressing HLA-DR, which you know is class two protein. And so if we go back in on these regions now and we look at higher res images of those, though these are these are fields of view that were uh, then rescanned based on that survey information, we can see that there is uh, there is uh, we can now see with much finer detail where the tumor cells are, and in particular, in the case of R1 on the left, where all these different immune cells are. And so, um, and in each one of these insets, you see we've zoomed in, and you can see sort of the juxtaposition of interesting immunoregulatory proteins in different immune cell subsets. And so this kind of gives you an idea of this microscope-like workflow then that you can do with MIBI, where you can go back and forth between sort of lower res 
survey scans and follow-up higher-res scans that can be used for segmentation and downstream image analysis. Uh, the one other thing which you might might have occurred to you as we're talking here is that um, is that you know as people often say it's like well if you rescan it uh, you know and maybe is a semi-destructive process you must be going into the tissue and that's exactly right so with each scan of the field we're probably taking off around we estimate around the top 100 to 200 nanometers so if you stay in the same field and you use the same conditions and you and you do multiple uh, and you do multiple images, we can actually start to see uh, Z information about the tissue structure. So this is a small field. This is about 100 micron field of view of a uh, melanoma. And uh, one of the things I've highlighted here, so you see in green, so DNA is, is in green, and sodium potassium ATPase is in blue, and in red is bimentin. And so the, this, dot, this area where I've got the dotted line, I want you to keep an eye on that nucleus, and these other areas of the solid lines, there's no nucleus there, but as I step through the planes, you can see that the nucleus that was on top is, is now going away. And those circled regions, you can start to see nuclei emerge as I step through here to where when we finally get to the last frame, you can see that now there's no nucleus where there was one, and you've got these two nuclei that are now at the top, uh, that, are, uh, that are at the top of the field. And also very interestingly, where there was just nucleus, now we not only see no nucleus, but we also see the vimentin and sodium potassium ATPase signals that have come in. So we're seeing the disappearance of nuclear signal and the emergence of membrane and cytoplasmic signal in reciprocal fashion. Uh, uh, one other last advantage of this being a mass spec platform is that MIBI has complete elemental coverage of the uh, uh, periodic table elemental coverage. So there's a lot of things that we can look at that are endogenous to the tissue itself that can inform our analysis. So for instance, uh, we can see phosphorus, which is within the nuclei of, uh, obviously because of the high degree of uh, phosphate content in DNA, and that overlays nicely with the DNA antibody. We can also see carbon, which serves as sort of like a nice negative thing for the tissue itself. And, and more, from a more uh, functional perspective, the other thing we can do is we can see uh, transition metals that are involved in biological processes like iron. And so here we're visualizing splenic macrophages, and so um, which are CD68 positive. But the other thing is, is that the top field there, you can see the one that's labeled iron. So we're actually looking at intracellular sequestered iron within these macrophages. And you can see that those macrophages, they not only have sequestered iron, but they have also, in response to that iron sequestration, have upregulated an enzyme called heme oxygenase 1, which is involved in porphyrin catabolism. And so in this sense, it's kind of cool because you can also probe some of these other metals uh, that uh, are known to be involved both in physiologic and pathologic, uh, and pathologic uh, biological processes. So um, now sort of shift gears in terms of application of this. We were very happy. We just recently had our first paper uh, accepted um, about a week or two ago. It was on triple negative breast cancer. Uh, a great large portion of this work was done by the first author, Leo Corinne, who did a beautiful job at the computational analysis. And I think that the other thing I wanted to spend the, the second half of this presentation on is, is talking about like, how do we construct a cohort? Uh, how do we use this tool then to look at a patient cohort in a meaningful way, and what are sort of some general heuristics that you know are are you know good sort of reference points for how to go about these analyses? So we went and we examined 41 triple negative breast cancer patients. These were all archival samples from um, the Stanford Tissue Bank that had come into Stanford over the last 10 years. We had clinical follow-up data on all these patients so we could see uh, disease-free survival, overall survival, and, uh, and we were able to correlate those things with the analysis that we did. And so we were very interested here in looking at the immune cell subsets present in these tumors. So you can see that the staining panel that we did was highly biased in that respect towards looking at immune cell subsets as well as checkpoint expression. So in a study like this, you know, the first question is, is it's like, you know, what are the main goals of, of the image post-processing analysis? Uh, and so this is where I think there's going to be a lot of really exciting work done over the next few years, sort of this evolving art 
of how to interpret high dimensional imaging data. And so, uh, and so I think, you know, the first one that might occur to everybody, right, is we want to, um, we want to know which cell phenotypes are present and, and how significant numbers of those cells are uh, present. And then it's an imaging assay. So obviously we want to know, is there anything important about each, each one of these cell populations and how they're uh, structurally organized relative to one another? And then lastly, um, you know, is you're going to find, so the one word of, you know, the one word of caution I would give us any, any high dimensional technique, whether it's, uh, you know, MIBI or, you know, even anything else where you have a lot of parameters is that you're going to find something. You'll always find something. So the, so the big question is, is can you, is there some sort of, you know, endpoint or clinical outcome that you can correlate uh, the data that you're getting out with so that you can kind of sift through this large multitude of findings to find the things that may seem to be most relevant to the problem. And so this is something that we try to focus on very hard in my lab is uh, not only in the data analysis, but in the initial construction of the patient cohort that we're sort of setting ourselves up to be able to answer those types of questions. But so the first thing then is before we can go do anything is we need to somehow get these images and get them into a form where we can extract information about individual cells. So uh, the first step in that is you essentially need to have a way to draw the borders around each individual cell within the image. And so this is called image segmentation. Uh, usually it starts with, with uh, drawing borders around the nuclei of cells. And one of the things that we found was that a lot of the existing tools for this, they, they tend to not work really well in images where, there's, where the cell shape can vary uh, a lot. And so if you have a bunch of small cells and a bunch of big cells, uh, the, the existing tools seem to do well in one or the other, but it was hard to get them to work well on everything at once. And so um, we worked with the David Van Valen lab at Caltech to be able to work, build upon their previous work on uh, using deep cell, which was originally done for segmenting bacteria and microscope images, and we used it here to, uh, it's, a, it's a convolutional neural network approach, and we were able, in relatively short order, to, do, to feed in some training data to get the nuclear segmentation to work appreciably better. So you can see here um, the segment, the neural network that we're using uh, is in green, and in red is uh, the output from Elastic, which is a, uh, a tool, which is a tool that's been out uh, for for a while that you know works reasonably well, but has problems where there's a lot of differences in, in uh, chromatin. So we've been very happy with this, and we're building upon this right now to hopefully end up with a uh, a convolutional neural network pipeline that can do full uh, cell segmentation and sort of multicellular feature recognition. Um, we're hoping to move that along within the next 12 months or so. But once you have those single cell features drawn, we can then add together all of the signal for each antibody in each cell and essentially generate something that would be similar to like an FCS file for flow cytometry where we have every single cell and we have the total amount of protein and the different, not only within the cell itself, but within different subcellular compartments, so whether it's nuclear, cytoplasmic, um, and then we also have the, 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 the spatial coordinates for those cells. So the first thing we do then is we just simply do a clustering to identify unique cell clusters and phenotypes. Uh, in this case, we use Flosum. And so you can see there that essentially what comes out is sort of the uh, major uh, immune cell subsets that a lot of people are interested in. So, and um, now that we have those, we can actually go through and map back onto the original data using uh, just a color map where the different immune cell subsets are. So for instance, um, and, just to, and just to show you, going back to the primary antibody imaging data, you can see this yellow, these yellow cells uh, are CD20 positive, whereas that one orange cell in there is uh, CD56 positive, uh, which is for, and, and the yellow cells are B cells, the orange cells are NK cells. So, you know, the, the algorithm is by no means perfect, but by and large, we found the assignment accuracy to be, uh, to be pretty good and, and definitely sufficient for the questions that we wanted to ask here. So then uh, sort of asking, okay, so what does it look like then if we look at these 42 patients? Uh, this shows you the pseudo-colored 
uh, sort of high-level view of all 42 patients. And what you see then is, right, it's a grayish tumor, and anything that's not gray is a different type of immune cell. So, you know, the one thing that jumps out to you probably is that there's definitely, there's two big differences amongst these. That, you know, there's a lot of tumors that don't have very many immune cells at all. And then of the one, and then there's some tumors that have a ton of immune cells, and the abundance of which immune cells are there, the relative makeup can, can, can vary pretty dramatically. So you can see that here. So if we look at patient 16 compared to patient 24, patient 24 has essentially, you know, nothing but macrophages and also has a very low number of immune cells. Whereas patient 16 has a wide diversity uh, of immune cells and is a very, very different composition. So one of the first things we saw is if we went and we took all of those patients and we ordered them, if we sorted them according to how many immune cells they had in their tumors, we found that there was this stepwise progression of which immune cell lineages uh, about essentially uh, that certain immune cell lineages, the presence of those was contingent upon the presence of other immune cells. So what do I mean by that? Um, so essentially, if we look at, let's say, B cells, every single tumor we looked at, if it had B cells, there were also CD4 Ts, CD8 Ts, and macrophages. Um, any tumor that had any immune cells at all always had macrophages there. And this sort of makes sense, and we think that these ones that have only macrophages could well be what we probably are reading out is the, uh, is the tissue resident macrophages within, within the tissue. But there was a stepwise recruitment that was very striking. And, you know, and probably most striking was the presence of natural killer cells was completely correlated 100% of the time with the presence of macrophages, CD8, CD4s, and NP cells. Uh, in similar fashion, if we look sort of at checkpoint expression within these tumors, we also saw that there was a heavy interdependence of the, of the presence of checkpoint and other immune regulatory proteins uh, with one another. So, for instance, every single, every single tumor that had a high number of Tregs also had cells that expressed LAG3, PD-1, pd one and IDO. Um, now, so then the question is, is which cell types, now that we've identified all these different cell types, which ones are co-localized more frequently than you'd expect by chance? And so that's the big thing is which ones, how can we then ask questions in a sort of a large data set in a statistically valid fashion to where we can tease out which, when we see co-approximation of two cell types, that when we see that, we know that it is something that probably could not have happened randomly. And so the big thing to think about when asking these types of questions is that when you look at a tissue section, as you saw in those other examples, the abundance of a particular cell population can vary dramatically, right? I mean, some of these tumors have 5,000 immune cells in a single field, whereas some of them only have 30 immune cells. Some of these tumors have, you know, and, and, huge, huge numbers of CD4s and CD8s, and some of them have nothing but macrophages. So, so the abundance of the cell populations is very dramatically. Not only that, the, where these different cell types are located within the tumors can also vary simply based on the innate sort of histological properties of the tissue we're looking at. So then what we want to do is, is we want to come up with a way to be able to look at the co-approximation of two different cell types and know that even if we account for the, num the total abundance of those different cell types and the inherent sort of tissue structure, that it's more likely than not that those two cell types preferentially ended up next to one another because of factors other than what we would expect just by random chance because there's just so many of them. So, so here's an example. Here's a little cartoon of a, of a, of a tumor where we have a, a population of green cells and a population of red cells. And so the question we want to ask then is, is, like, is, is, are the red cells next to the green cells, is that a preferential interaction, or are they just next to each other because there just happen to be lots of green cells in, in the vicinity, you know, many, many more green cells than there are red cells. And so that not, there's essentially nowhere else for the red cells to be other than next to so the best way to ask that question then is is to take this tumor, and we're gonna we're gonna keep the we're gonna keep the green cells as phenotype one. We're gonna keep all those in the same place, and then what we're gonna do is, is we're gonna go and we're gonna randomize 
the location of all the red cells to all the different cell positions uh, within the tumor. And, and each time we do a randomization, that's going to be like one sort of randomized tumor, and we're going we're gonna to essentially make around you know, 10,000 different randomizations like that. And so what that does then is, is that for each one of those randomizations, we can look at sort of a pairwise distance matrix to know what the average distance between a red cell and a green cell is. And we do that for the randomized samples to get a, to get a statistical distribution of what it looks like when the, when the tissue's been randomized. And we then compare that with the actual original sample. And by doing that, we're able to generate a z-score for the statistical significance of those pairwise interactions. And so here, and so how do we use this? So one of the first things we did was looking very generally at sort of, if we look purely at all the different markers and did pairwise, uh, you know, um, randomized, uh, that pair, pairwise, uh, a pairwise distance matrix where we use this randomization to attain these scores, um, which markers are co-localized more often than not? And one of the first things we saw was that there in some tumors, there was a high preference for tumor markers and immune markers to be co-localized, but for immune and tumor markers to be sort of mutually exclusive to one another, at least spatially so. Whereas in other tumors, we found that um, this wasn't true at all and that there really didn't seem to be much of a difference in how immune markers and tumor markers were located uh, within the tissue. And you can actually see that uh, in these pseudo-colored images of these two tumor fields. So tumor cells here are in blue, immune cells are in orange. And so you can see that the one on the left where we saw this co this co-localization with tumor or with immune, but not between the two, that there is this interesting sort of compartmentalized phenotype of the tumor where the immune cells and the tumor cells are segregated away from one another. Whereas in the, there's another phenotype that we see on the right, which is a mixed phenotype where tumor cells and immune cells seem to be much more admixed. And um, there is a little bit of a relationship with uh, whether things are compartmentalized or mixed based on the total number of immune cells there. But by and large, this seems to be a, another axis to describe these types of tumors of whether or not um, they're cold, which is where they have very few immune cells that are, or what we think is sort of the more intriguing case, at least for this study, which is in the case where there are a significant number of immune cells, are these tumors mixed or compartmentalized? And so um, we're able to make that distinction then purely based, we're able to make it in an unbiased way, purely based on these distance matrices to be able to classify these tumors. And so one of the interesting things we immediately saw with this was that um, was looking at pd one expression. And so pd one is a checkpoint protein that is also targeted by, uh, by um, uh, monoclonal therapeutics. Um, the interesting thing about pd one is that it can be expressed both by tumor and it can also be expressed by immune cells. And this is actually something that can be sort of difficult to delineate in regular chromogenic IHC. Um, and so what we found was, was that if you broke down pd one expression, tumor pd one expression, and the immune cell pd one expression, you looked at that ratio, the ratio of the number of pd one positive tumor cells to pd one positive immune cells for each patient, uh, what we found was is the compartmentalized tumors were heavily biased to having pd one expression on immune cells, whereas these mixed tumors were much more likely to have pd one expression on tumor cells. And as an example here, you can see also that if we just simply enumerate all of the pd one positive tumor cells in each tumor, that if you look at the uh, if you look at the number that we see in the mixed compared with the compartmentalized, there's far more pd one positive tumor cells in the mixed uh, histological group than in the compartmentalized group. Um, this sort of just shows examples of, of those two types, of those two histological types. The so patient 33 is was classified as mixed, and you can see pd one expression is on tumor cells. And whereas patient five was classified as compartmentalized, and we see a heavy preference for pd one expression to be on the immune cells. Now, similarly, another thing that we saw was on IDO expression, which uh, is uh, which we found was there wasn't as much of a of a sort of one to one uh, difference between tumor and immune as we saw at pd one. But what we did see was that IDO expression in general, when it was there, there was a heavy bias for pd one immune cells. 
uh, in the compartmentalized tumors. And lastly, which is also very interesting, was that we found that there was a very big preference for PD-1 positivity, so PD-1 being the, the T cell checkpoint receptor, uh, to, when it, to be on CD4 T cells in the compartmentalized tumors, whereas there was a much higher degree of CD8 PD-1 cells in the mixed tumors. And so now we're painting a picture where just simply based on the relative spatial, the spatial distribution of immune cells and tumor cells, we see that pd one expression seems to be, its disposition, whether it's on immune cells or tumor cells, seems to be highly co correlated with that, as does the presence of IDO in immune cells, as well as whether or not PD-1 expression is preference towards CD4 T cells or CD8 T cells. Now, if we look closer at the compartmentalized tumors, and we, one of the nice things that we can do with this data is we can also go and we can break down each uh, of the compartmentalized tumors into, into three regions and to, where we can look at six different uh, cell phenotypes. And so we can look at, and here you see there's a light blue and sort of an orange region that identifies the tumor immune border. And so the light blue region is the tumor side of that, and the orange is the immune side of that border. The dark blue is what we've sort of, we've gated out as being the tumor bulk, and the red is what we're talking about as being sort of the immune bulk. And so we can now see cells that are at the immune cells that are at the tumor immune border, tumor cells that are at the tumor immune border. We can see tumor cells that are within the bulk, immune cells that are within the bulk, and then, also very interestingly, we can also identify immune cells that have penetrated into the tumor bulk, as well as tumor cells that have penetrated into the immune bulk. And so one of the first things that we saw, if we just look at the tumor immune interfaces, it seems to be some very interesting uh, gradients of expression that lie along that border. And so one, is that we, when we've seen this in several tumors since then, is that if you look at two of the epigenetic modifiers that we looked at here, which were post-translational modifications for histone H3, um, you can see that uh, for H3K9 acetylation and K27 trimethylation, at that tumor immune border, there is a heavy uh, bias towards acetylation that then transitions toward a bias for trimethylation as you move away from the tumor immune border. And we were able to see this in multiple tumors, um, as you can see on the Wilcox rank sum and C. But, and so we went and we looked at this for, uh, to see if there were other sort of representative motifs where we saw heavy enrichment of certain uh, expression uh, phenotypes, preferentially at the border. And one of the ones we saw that was very interesting was that right at the tumor immune border, there was a, there was a group of compartmentalized tumors that had this heavy enrichment of IDO, of, of immune cells on the immune side that expressed IDO, pd one CD11C, and CD11B. But very interestingly, on the tumor side, the tumors had upregulated HLA, uh, had upregulated MHC class two in, in the form of HLA-DR. And so um, th this was, uh, you know, we're now looking to, to look at this, at this tumor immune interface in this cohort more closely to see if this is uh, indeed possibly related to uh, a focal upregulation of interferon gamma. Um, but I think the main reason to care about all of these findings is that, uh, is that, is that we went back after the fact and looked at outcome data between simply looking if we if we classify these as compartmentalized or mixed. And what we found was there was a very big difference in survival between tumors that were, were classified as compartmentalized and tumors that were classified as mixed. With the compartmentalized tumors surviving uh, for longer, uh, seemingly longer periods of time. We we think that this could well be a marker of chemo responsiveness in triple negative breast cancer, but um, we're following up on this right now with a, with a withheld cohort uh, to see if that pans out uh, in, in, in those samples as well. So um, the last thing I would say is that uh, if you want to look at the data, 
We have all of the data upregulated to an online uh, uh, web viewer where you can you can toggle through all 42 tumors. You can make color overlays of any of the channels that we measured. Um, and so just to give you an idea what that looks like, here's uh, IMPATH is hosting the data for us, and this is one of tumors, one of the compartmentalized tumors, uh, kind of like what I was talking about before. You can see here this sort of bright, uh, uh, bright uh, enrichment of cells that are 11C and CD16 positive right at the tumor immune interface. And, you know, and so you, and within the interface, you can zoom in and zoom out to take a look. So we can, you know, if you zoom in, you can take a better look at, like, what those different immune cell subsets look like. So it's very nice. Um, and, it, and if you'd like to get an idea of, of you know, exactly what all of it uh, looks like, it, it's, a, it's a really great interface for exploring the data. You can also, from here, of course, download all the data as tips if you want to look at it within your, with your own imaging tools. And so with that, I'd just like to really thank uh, Liat Karin, who did a, a huge amount of the work on this paper and did the very elegant computational analysis that you saw. She's done a really great job with it and is continuing to work to build out um, that computational pipeline so it can be used for other disease types and, and, uh, and hopefully uh, something that might be a little more turnkey in the not too distant future for, for uh, labs that have a ton of biological expertise but maybe don't have the people in house that can um, you know generate uh, a lot of these computational pipelines. Uh, and also to Aaron McCaffrey who did a lot of the work with uh, that you saw looking at the uh, splenic macrophages. And lastly to Mark Bose who is the in-house instrument extraordinaire guru who uh, has been manning all of this stuff with the different tissue cohorts. And so um, with that, I would uh, really just like to thank all of our collaborators and a particularly big thank you to the uh, NIH for uh, funding this work at such an early stage to the Early Independence Award. And uh, with that, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Angelo, for your presentation. A quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions. Simply type them into the drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window, labeled Ask a Question, and click on the Send button. Dr. Angelo will answer as many questions as time permits. First question is, where would you purchase antibodies with elemental metal conjugated? And just give you a minute for that one. Let me know if you want me to repeat it. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfectly. Oh, Wait, you want me to repeat sorry. the question? So, no, no. So, so the uh, the um, the uh, IMPATH, the company that's commercializing technology, is going to be offering a, a product line of metal conjugated antibodies. But um, you can also uh, metal conjugate uh, your own reagents if you have primary antibodies in house, just using uh, metal conjugation kits that they also are selling. Um, the the big thing to remember with that is that um, the when doing the reaction to tether the metal chelator tag to the antibody, you need to have the antibody in a format where the buffer doesn't contain any protein. So it needs to be in a protein carrier-free format. So if there's BSA in there or any other uh, sort of stabilizing uh, protein carrier, it'll interfere with the conjugation. So just remember that if you're going to derivatize your own primary antibodies, they need to be in a purified format. Great, thank you. Next one is, when doing the incubation with all the tag antibodies, how do you control with such variations between antibodies like antigen retrieval solutions and time incubation, just to mention two factors? Uh, it's a great question. So um, we have found, so we try to, we, we pretty much picked a single epitope retrieval condition and we try to harmonize all of our reagents to that. So a lot of, work has been done over the last, you know, five, ten years, especially in the anatomic pathology space where they've gone through and sort of systematically compared these different epitope retrieval protocols. And, you know, essentially the, the old school way of doing it is, uh, 
is, you know, to use the, uh, a mildly acidic citrate buffer. Um, the, uh, within the last maybe five, ten years, um, alkaline buffers like Tris, Tris CDPA, uh, have become pretty popular. And we found, uh, and this is verified in a fair number of papers, that um, that seems to be pretty cross-compatible with most antibodies, you know, not all. I, I think the stats that I've read on is you use Tris EDTA for around 95% of reagents. Um, so the uh, now the question is, is that it, it, I think the thing is that people, when they conventionally think about this, they're going and they're trying to pick the epitope retrieval condition that gives the absolute most intense staining. And so what we found is, is you know, sometimes if you use Tris or Citrate, Maybe one of the other looks a little bit better, or but we're more by and large we're able to get the performance that we want just using Tris EDTA. Great, okay, thank you. Next one is how is it possible to rescan if the tissue is damaged due to the laser, and is it performed on serial sections? So well, the, well so the first thing is to remember about this, and one of the things that makes the platform I think different, right, is that is that the the, the the method which we rem which we liberate uh, secondary ions is not with a laser. It's with a particle beam. And so, you know, a laser beam, you know, just light. This is a particle beam, meaning that we're actually shooting charged ions, you know, atoms that have had electrons removed at the surface. And so in doing this, um, where uh, it, this is, it, it's based on a method called secondary ion mass spectrometry, which has been around for many decades. And, used pretty heavily in the semiconductor industry and some other areas. And one of the reasons they like it so much is because the, um, the erosion rate of, of how quickly you burrow through a specimen is very, is very, can be very finely controlled, actually to a degree that's far greater than anything you would need here. I mean, you know, that Intel does stuff like this where they're milling craters with SIMS beams on the order of a few nanometers. Um, Essentially, though, what that means is, is that as we're milling through the tissue, with each pass, we use like standard four micron thick sections. And with each pass, we're removing a small fraction of the bulk uh, as we go over it. So we're usually only removing maybe the top 100, 200 nanometers or so. And so that means then that we can sequentially scan the samples and, uh, and, and get, you know, repeat scanning and either derive Z-depth information or use that as a means of, of, uh, of you know, of going back and forth between surveys and high res. Very good, thank you. What do you think is the limiting factor with this technology, and how do you compare it with the ablative technology in imaging mass cytometer? So, I mean, the limiting factor here, I think, um, and really with any of them, is going to be uh, is going to be probably you know sample throughput. This isn't. You know, if you look at, um, the, it's definitely not at the point where you can do, you know, an un, you, you can essentially design a study with, with you know, n without any regard of having to think about, um, you know, how many samples you want to run. So, you know, now it's sort of like you wanted to do a, if you're just scanning, you know, H&Es or chromogenic stain, like with some of the modern slide scanners, those, those slide scanners are extraordinarily fast. I mean, you you can do a ton of light-based scans, but obviously you don't have the multiplexing capability. So, you know, I think the I think the challenges of the next few years are to, you know, or to make the uh, the system, um, in, uh, you know, build it to have increased throughput and also make the computational tools, as kind of I was alluding to at the end, more seamless and and more turnkey. Um, in regards to the comparison with uh, the blade of technologies like the IMC. I think the really, you know, there's a few big differences here, and there's a reason that, uh, and there's some reasons that we decided to go down this road rather than, you know, using a laser ablation technique. Um, one is that, uh, you know, the ionization yield and sensitivity using SIMS is a good bit higher. It's about 10, 10 15 times higher than you can get with a uh, laser ablation ICPMS. Uh, and a big reason for that is because, you know, the ionization is performed in vacuum, and so there's no ion loss of the uh, whereas with the laser ablation platforms, laser ablation is actually done under atmosphere, and then it has to be transported with a carrier gas and into the plasma, and then after it gets out of the plasma, it's got to get into the vacuum for the mass spec, and there's a lot of losses that are incurred there. Um, the other big difference is the uh, resolution. Um, 
you know, the laser ablation platforms, I think, get between the spot sizes of the lasers are in the order of like one or two microns. Um, the spot sizes we can get here are a good bit lower. You know, they're on the order of like two, three hundred nanometers, if, if that's what you prefer to run at. Although, you know, kind of like as I talked about, um, that does come at a trade-off to some extent on, on, on uh, throughput. But the other is also, uh, you know, a sort of speed, I think. And so um, there's really no upper limit to have with the pixel acquisition speeds with, um, with uh, MIBI because um, the ions are extracted at such extremely high velocities that we don't have problems with pixel crosstalk, even if we were going as fast as like 10,000 pixels per second. And uh, most of the laser ablation platforms, I think the fastest they can go is around, uh, you know, 100, 150 pixels per second. So um, throughput's another uh, really big consideration. And, that, and then the last one, I think, is that, you know, in both cases, right, I think that um, even though the system is faster, even uh, it's not so fast that, you know, like we were saying, you could do anything that you wanted. And so one thing that you can do here that you can't do with the other ones is, is tissue rescanning because laser ablation platforms, um, the pulse to pulse variability of the laser is the CV is very high. So in order to get like something consistent when you're imaging, you essentially almost have to do full tissue ablation. You can't really do um, rescanning. So uh, you know, so, so that means that essentially the throughput you have is the throughput that you have. Whereas here, because we can go up and down and dramatically increase throughput by uh, doing survey resolutions, you know, we can kind of exploit that to to, to do some. Uh, larger scale studies that might not be possible otherwise. Thank you. How many rescans can you perform without degradation of signal? Mm, probably about, I mean, we can usually get eight to 10 without much of a problem. Although, you know, I mean, that does, we have found that, um, you know, different tissues seem to etch and sputter away faster than others. And so the more connective tissue and fat, you know, it seems to be more it seems to be just probably just less material overall. Uh, but usually in general, you know, if we're looking at tumors or, or um, you know, or pretty much, you know, we, when we look at brain or any sort of, uh, you know, wide spectrum of samples, usually get around 10, at least five. Okay. It looks like we have time for one more question, and it is, were there any drastic differences in the expression pattern of the tumor cells between compartmentalized tumor and mixed tumor? For example, were the expression of PD-1 and PD-L1 on tumor cells very different among the two types of tumor? Yes. So um, one of the major differences that we saw between the compartmentalized and the, and the mixed tumors is that, you know, the pd one is very interesting because it can be, uh, you know, it can be expressed on tumor cells or on immune cells. And one of the really striking things that we found was that the mixed tumors seem to have a heavy, heavy predominance and excess of tumor cells expressing pd one what relative to the compartmentalized tumors. And in the compartmentalized tumors, the pd one expression was by and large found on immune cells. And so there definitely was this... Uh, this, this correlation between the histological distribution of the cell types and the disposition of checkpoint expression. Thank you. I would like to once again thank Dr. Angelo for his presentation. Do you have any final comments? No, I, I was just going to say, um, you know, we can, uh, there was a few things in here where people were wanting to get links to the data to the paper, and I, I think we can uh, send all that out. And um, my, uh, Feel free if anybody has any questions, you're more than welcome to uh, email me and I'll, I'll try to get back with you. That is great. Thank you. I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. We would like to thank our sponsor, IonPath, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand through April 2019. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.